Welcome to this, my fourth update for my data for January 2019. In this update, I'd like to talk about risk. Now, we all agree about risk, right? The only thing we actually agree about on risk is that if you invest in equities, you're exposed to risk. That's pretty much where the agreement ends, because almost every other aspect of risk, we disagree. We disagree about whether risk is a good thing or a bad thing, whether it should be avoided or sought out, whether how you measure risk. On almost every aspect of risk, there's disagreement. So I know as I go through this session, you are going to disagree with me, and that's healthy. We should be having this debate about what risk is and how to measure it. Let's start off with some basics about risk. When we think about risk, we assign assets as risky assets to safe assets, but that is really not the truth. Risk is a continuum. At one end of the spectrum, we have risk-free investments. Risk-free investments are investments where you're guaranteed a return and your principal is fully protected. At the other end of the spectrum, you have really risky investments where not only are you uncertain about future returns, you're not sure whether you'll get your principal back. All investments fall somewhere in that spectrum. Now, in traditional finance, to make lives convenient for ourselves, we assume that there are risk-free investments and we usually assign this particular category to government bonds. Implicit there is the assumption that governments don't default and that the returns we're talking about are nominal returns. After all, the rate on a government bond might be guaranteed, but if inflation is uncertain, your real rate of return might not be. But that question of whether there's anything risk-free is for a different session. But when you think about risk, think about it on a continuum. Second, risk comes from many places. What do I mean by that? When you invest in a company, the types of risk you're exposed to, you can list out dozens and dozens of pages. So to make my life easier, I usually categorize risk into three groupings. The first is, is it estimation risk or economic risk? Estimation risk is risk that you could be wrong about an input because you haven't done your homework. Economic risk is risk that comes from underlying economic forces. You're saying, why do you care? Well, estimation risk you can reduce and perhaps even eliminate by doing more of your homework, collecting more data. Economic risk is immune from that kind of preparation. I have some bad news for you. If you're, in, if you're thinking about valuing companies, much of the risk you're exposed to is economic risk. No amount of homework on your part is going to make that risk go away. The second categorization is it micro risk or macro risk. Micro risk are risk related to your company, how well it's managed, the competition, the business, etc. Macro risks are risk coming from the outside, interest rates, the economy, what governments do. Micro risk is risk that can be diversified away. And that sounds fancy, but if you have multiple stocks and investments, to the extent micro risks move in different directions, you're going to get the law of large numbers working in your favor. Macro risk, no matter how diversified you get, you will be exposed to. And that is the risk we usually build into discount rates if you're valuing a company for a diversified investor. And finally, you can have risks that are discrete risks and risks that are continuous risk. The best way of, of illustrating the difference is to think in terms of exchange rates. If you invest in a country with fixed exchange rates, you face no risk from exchange rates, right? Until you get a devaluation. That's discrete risk. In contrast, if you invest in a market where there are floating exchange rates, every time exchange rates move, you're going to feel it, either in good ways or bad ways. That's continuous risk. Why do I draw this contrast? Finance as we know it is directly, is most, it, it's best suited for continuous risk. We adjust discount rates for continuous risk fairly easily. We have a tougher time with discrete risk. For those, we need probabilistic approaches like decision trees to bring them in. Third, there is a contrast between the risk you face when you invest in a company as the only company investment and the risk that you face when that company is added to a portfolio. I know that when I, when I say this, you're drawn to modern portfolio theory and you're saying, oh, right, I, I don't believe that. But this is pure statistics. It basically means that when you put more investments in your portfolio, the risks that are specific to the investment tend to average out. In this graph, for instance, I show what happens as you increase the number of investments in your portfolio from 1 to 50. A couple of things. One is the savings you get by building a portfolio increase as your stocks get less correlated. Notice what I said, less correlated. You can have stocks that move most of the time together. Let's say the correlation is 80%. That's a really high correlation, but you will still benefit from diversifying. Of course, if the correlation is only 20%, the benefits will be even greater. The second thing to note is most of the savings happen as you do your first few additions. 
In fact, by the time you get to 10 or 12 investments in your portfolio, you're 80% of the way to being fully diversified. So being diversified doesn't have to be the enemy of picking stocks. You can pick stocks and be diversified at the same time. And finally, let's talk about risk measures. Broadly speaking, there are three measures of risk that investors use. The first are price-based measures, where you take the stock prices of a traded asset and use those stock prices over time to extract measures of risk for that stock. The second is earnings or cash flow measures, where you look at the past history of earnings and cash flows and you try to get a sense of how risky a company is based on those. And third are proxies, stand-ins for risk where you look at some measure, some characteristic of a company, and you draw conclusions about risk. I'll give you an example. Small companies, presumably, are riskier than larger companies. Low P-E ratio stocks are considered safer than high P-E ratio stocks by some value investors. These are proxies because you're letting P-E or market capitalization stand in for risk. And as I said, this is a data update, so I want to bring you up to date with what these numbers in different dimensions look like for risk across the world. Let's start with price-based risk measures. The biggest advantage of price-based risk measures is price data is easily available and on a continuous basis. I can get daily data or even intraday data. So getting risk measures from prices has become easier and easier over time. And let's face it, because it's become easier, we've tended to rely on them more and more, perhaps to an unhealthy, uh, to an unhealthy measure. So let's start with the types of price-based measures you can use to measure risk. The most simplistic price-based measure you can have is look at the difference in the high price and the low price over a particular period. So you look at a 52-week high and a 52-week low, you're saying, what is that going to tell me? The more volatile a stock, the bigger the spread should be. The problem though is if I look at the absolute spread, a $100 stock will always have a bigger spread between high and low prices than a $10 stock price. So, get- so here's how you can get around it. You take the difference between the high price and the low price, and you divide by the high price plus the low price. You're saying, what are you doing? Let's take an example. Let's assume you have a stock where the high has been 50 and a low of 25. It's a high price stock. And then you have a low price stock where the high was 12 and the low was 8. Using my measures, the first stock is riskier than the second. It's a scale measure of the spread. Let's look at what that number looks like across the market. So this is a distribution of the high-low risk measures across the globe. Now you see the distribution below and then the regional medians and the first and the third quartiles. Some interesting and surprising results here. The US, Australia and Canada are riskier if you use this risk measure than Africa and the Middle East. You're saying, what's going on? If you look at the approach, the high-low approach, the, the pluses are it's easy to compute and it requires minimal data. All you need is the high and the low price. It's even intuitive. Most investors say if a stock has a bigger spread, it's riskier. But here it's, are its um, limitations. First, it throws away a lot of data between the high and the low price. You're throwing away the data in the middle. But here's the other and bigger problem. And this is perhaps a problem that all price-based measures are going to have. This approach is built on or depends on how much liquidity there is in the stock. Remember, for the price to move, people have to trade. So the less trading there is, the less risky your stock will be. So perhaps the reason the U.S. looks riskier than Africa is because U.S. stocks are more liquid than African stocks. So let's look at the second measure of risk from prices, and that is to look at the standard deviation in stock prices. This is, after all, something that you'd expect to do whenever you have data. You have data over time, in this case stock prices, you can compute the standard deviation in those stock prices over time. Of course, to make them comparable and to make them readable, it's probably better to state those standard deviations in annualized terms. But presumably, if you want to scale this number, if you just look at the standard deviation absolute prices, again, you're going to bias yourself towards finding higher price stocks to be riskier. It's perhaps better to do the standard deviation in in returns, but this is a change in prices or log prices. If you have no idea what that does, it pretty much converts your stock prices into a scale variable that is comparable. So if you look at the standard deviation stock prices, the leap of faith you're making is you're assuming that stocks that have more volatile prices are riskier than stocks where prices are more stable. So let's look at what this number looks like around the globe. Again, you see the distribution around the globe in in addition to the regional differences. Again, the more liquid markets look riskier on a standard deviation basis simply because liquidity pushes up standard deviation. As with the pricing measures are pluses and minuses. The pluses of standard deviation, it's stat 101. 
whenever you have lots of data, computing a standard deviation does give you a measure of volatility. Second, it is a measure you can compute for any asset class. I can compute the standard deviation in stock returns, bond returns, real estate returns, Bitcoin returns, allows me to compare investments in different asset classes. And to the extent that we can also compute returns on these asset classes, it gives you a platform for comparing returns to risk. In fact, one very widely used ratio that's been around in modern portfolio theory is called the Sharpe ratio, where you look at the excess returns you earn, the difference between the returns on an asset class and a risk-free investment, and, and you divide that by the standard deviation of returns in that asset class to come up with a ratio. The higher the ratio, the better the trade-off you're getting on risk. A lot of risk measures in finance build around re expected returns and standard deviations. What are the minuses? There are, there's only one distribution, statistically, that it can be characterized entirely with its average and its standard deviation. That is the normal distribution. And in finance, it is true. We have an unhealthy obsession with the normal distribution. Why? Because it makes life so convenient for us. Unfortunately, the investment world is not normally distributed. Others have made this case much more eloquently than I do, but the point I'm making is sometimes the standard deviation. Often, in fact, the standard deviation might not give you a complete assessment of the risk in an investment. Second, and this puzzles some investors, standard deviation looks at the deviation of actual returns from an expected return. It doesn't differentiate between upside and downside. A stock that has a 100% return is punished just as much as a stock with a minus 50% return in terms of having a higher standard deviation. Now, if you're an investor, you're saying, that makes no sense to me. But implicitly, again, if you have a symmetric distribution like the normal distribution, you can get away with it. But you can see why some people are troubled by using standard deviation in prices. Third, there are liquidity effects, as with, uh, as with high-low prices. And finally, the standard deviation of a stock measures its exposure to all risk. And as I said earlier, if you're a diversified investor, that might not be a good measure of risk for you. Which brings me with my third measure of risk. The third measure of risk, you look at an investment from the perspective of a diversified investor. And if you're a diversified investor holding 20, 25, 30 stocks in your portfolio, the risk of an investment is the risk it adds to your portfolio. And as the number of stocks in your portfolio go up, the risk added by an investment in your portfolio is a function of one variable, how it moves with your portfolio, the correlation between your investment and your portfolio. In fact, it's called the covariance, the correlation times the standard deviation of your investment times the standard deviation of the portfolio. Again, the problem with the covariance is it's not standardized. If I told you the covariance of IBM at the market is 30%, your reaction might be, is that high, is that low? I have no idea. So here's what we do to make life convenient for ourselves. We divide that covariance of every investment of the portfolio by the variance of that portfolio. The same variance for every investment. You're saying, what does it accomplish? It converts your covariance into what's called a beta. So the beta of an investment measures the risk added to a portfolio and it's scaled. It's scaled around what? It's scaled around one. So if you look at the distribution for the correlation, which is the key number driving the beta, and we'll come back to betas in a future data, in a future post. The correlation across the world looks like this. And you can see that the median correlation across the world is about 15 to 20%. If you remember the graph that I showed you on what happens to a portfolio as you diversify, with a correlation of 0.20 or 20%, you can see very quickly the benefits of diversification. Now, I'm not going to browbeat you by saying you should diversify because if you're absolutely certain about your valuation and absolutely certain that the price will adjust to value, all the more power to you, you should just invest in one stock. The more uncertain you feel about your valuations, the more uncertain you are about whether markets will correct, the more diversified you need to get. So let's talk a little bit about the pluses and minuses of covariance-based approaches. If you're a diversified investor, I think this is a better measure of risk. And, it's, and if you convert to a beta, it's a self-standing measure. In what sense? If I tell you a beta for an investment is 1.2, I don't need to tell you any more about the investment for you to decide whether it's riskier or safer than average. 1.2 is higher than one, which is across, the average across all investments. It is a riskier investment. What are the minuses? The biggest minus in my perspective, from my point of view is that is, is the measure's dependence on the correlation. You're saying, so what? The correlation between an investment in the market is both unstable and noisy, which means it moves all the time. 
If you run one regression for your stock against a market and you get a beta, be very cautious because that beta can be very different in the next time period or with a different market index. It is for that reason when we talk about betas in the next few sessions, I'll talk about what I use instead of a single regression beta. But covariance measures, the weakest link is the correlation. Now, there are a lot of value investors who don't like price-based measures and you can see why. If you are a believer in intrinsic value, you start off with the presumption that markets can make mistakes. It therefore seems inconsistent to then use a price-based risk measure in intrinsic valuation. I entirely understand that logic. I'll come back and talk about why, in spite of understanding that logic, I don't take the next step. Because many value investors say, why not use the risk in earnings or cash flow, something fundamental instead? Well, the simplest proxy for risk that's based on earnings is to see if you're a money-making or a money-losing company. In this table, I've looked at the percentage of companies that are making and losing money. And I use three measures of earnings, EBITDA, operating income, and net income. Obviously, far more companies lose money on a net income basis than on an operating income or an EBITDA basis. But you can see the distribution around the world of what company, what percentage of companies in each part of the world are losing money. Australia and Canada, if you look at the most, and this is just the most recent year, had the largest percentage of money losing companies. Japan had the highest percentage. Make of it what you will, but it's a very simplistic approach to risk because it misses a lot of, of the uncertainty you still face, face in earnings, even if you're making money. But it's a zero one game, where if you're losing money, you're a risky company, you're making money, you're a safer company. And of course, a more complete measure of risk based on earnings is to look at the volatility in earnings. Now, this is actually more difficult than it sounds because earnings can be both positive and negative and computing percentage changes in earnings when earnings are negative can be problematic. In this table, in this graph, I've looked at the standard deviation in operating income and net income for companies over the last 10 years, if to the extent that you have 10 years of data. And if you don't, however many years you have data for. Now, of course, if I stop there, companies with higher dollar earnings will have higher standard deviations. So standard deviation is in a dollar value. So to make them comparable, here's what I did. I took the standard deviation in earnings of a company and then divided by the average earnings a company had over the period. It's called coefficient of variation in earnings and the higher this number the, the more volatile earnings are. In this graph you see the distribution of that number across the world and again the regional differences on that number. So if you're a believer in using fundamentals and you don't want to use prices you can go with earnings measures whether it's simplistic in the sense of money making versus money losing or earnings volatility. But walk in with open eyes because here's the problem with earnings based measures. Unlike stock prices that get measured every minute of every day as trading goes on, earnings get measured when accountants choose to measure them. In the US, accounting earnings get updated once every quarter. You're saying, so what? Well, the number of observations you're going to have on earnings for a company are going to be limited. So the first problem you have is you will not have as much data with earnings as you do with stock prices. The second, we know accountants tend to smooth out earnings. They do it with the best of intentions. Depreciation is a classic example. You don't show the capex in one year, they spread it out. So accountants tend to spread out numbers. So your earnings are going to be smoother than your true operation simply because accountants make it so. And third, to the extent that accountants use their discretion on how to deal with acquisitions, how to measure inventory, your earnings can be affected by those choices. So having weighed the pluses and minuses, I've considered using earnings-based measures. I've come back to price-based measures simply because I trust markets more than I trust accountants. Finally, let's talk about proxies. Many investors say it's pointless looking at variance in prices or variance in earnings. I'm going to use a proxy for risk. Small companies are riskier than large companies. Low PE stocks are riskier, are safer than high PE stocks. Well, I, I can understand the reason people look at proxies, but I think it makes sense to follow up and say, hey, do these proxies actually work? Let me start with market capitalization. Are smaller companies riskier than larger companies? Here's what I did. I broke companies into 10 deciles and I looked at risk measures, both price-based and earnings-based risk measures. So price-based measures, I looked at the high-low risk, the standard deviation in stock price and the correlation with the market. And earnings-based measures, I looked at percentage of companies with negative net income and the coefficient of variation in income. 
Here's the good news if you use market cap as your proxy for risk. Smaller companies are riskier than larger companies if you look at both price-based measures and earnings-based measures. But much of the risk, if you look at the correlation, is company-specific risk. You're saying, what does that mean? If you invest in three, four, or five companies, you want to steer away from small companies. Of course, they're riskier to you. If you invest in 40 or 50 companies, in other words, you have a diversified portfolio, small companies may no longer be riskier than larger companies. So depending on how diversified you are, size of a company may or may not be a good proxy for risk. You're saying, what about PE ratios? The, the story I've heard from value investors is when you invest in low PE stocks, you face less risk than high PE stocks. Again, to see if this is true, I looked at both price-based and earnings-based measures. And again, I'll give you the, the good news and the bad news. The good news is that there's a, you know, that money losing companies are riskier than money making companies. The bad news is looking only at companies where you can compute the PE ratio, which are companies with earnings, the relationship between PE ratios and risk measures is very weak. In other words, if you use screens based on PE ratios and you throw away the companies for which you cannot compute PE ratios, the power of PE ratios to proxy for risk drops off. The same perhaps can be said about dividend yields. The riskiest stocks are the stocks that don't pay dividends, but among the stocks that pay dividends, there's the relationship between the level of dividend yield, the argument that high dividend yield stocks are somehow less risky than low dividend, doesn't hold up if you look at the data. Finally, as a proxy, many, many investors look at what sector you're in. Maybe you've heard the story. If you invest in utility stocks, they're, they're safe. If you invest in tech companies, they're risky. To see if industry rankings correlate with these rules of thumb, I rank companies based on price risk measures. So if I look at stock price volatility, for instance, these are the safest and riskiest companies, and there seems to be some basis for those rules of thumb. Utilities and financial service companies are among the safest sectors, or safest companies, a lot of technology stocks, and at least in 2018, a lot of commodity and natural resource companies are among the riskiest. That's with price risk. You get almost a, a similar type of ranking. Same, se same sectors show up when you look, so look at earnings volatility. So maybe it's not a bad rule of thumb to look at sectors. But my, you know, I've, as I've said in earlier posts, within sectors, you should expect a wide diversity of risk. For instance, with tech companies, I have a post from a long time ago where I divided tech into old tech, middle-aged tech, and young tech. And it's young tech stocks that are the riskiest. Old tech stocks look a lot like mature companies in other sectors. That's for another post. But when you assign an entire sector as a risky sector, that's, that's a downside. So here's my final parting pieces of advice if you want any advice. The first is avoiding risk is not a strategy especially during period, periods of crisis, that becomes front and center for some investors. Let me avoid risk. Let me get away from it. That's not a great investment strategy. When you make investments, your objective is to earn returns and risk is a constraint. It's a very important constraint, but it should not be an objective. Pick the risk level that you're comfortable with and then go out and make the investments that are best suited given that risk level. So I'm not saying, you know, you should not, you, you should take a lot of risk. Take the risk that you're comfortable with but risk avoidance should not be the center of your investment, uh, investment philosophy. Second, you can have problems with the models and measures of risk that other people use. So you might not like betas and covariance. You might not even like price-based risk measures. That's perfectly okay. But in the process, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't tell me that you don't worry about risk or you don't care about risk. That makes no sense to me. So you can abandon models and measures, but don't abandon first principles. And finally, find a risk measure that works for you. I could tell you what works for me, but that's me. You have to find the risk measure that works for you. And what's it going to depend on? First, it depends on whether you're an investor or a trader. You're saying, what's the difference? Investors value things and then hope the price moves to the value. Traders buy at a low price, hoping to sell at a high price. For value-based investors, it does make sense to look at earnings or cash flow-based risk measures, perhaps in conjunction with other measures. If you're a trader, you should be looking at high-low prices or standard deviation in stock prices. It depends on your time horizon. Do you have a 10-year time horizon or a six-month time horizon? And finally, it depends on whether you have a diversified portfolio or whether you have a concentrated portfolio. Make your choice based on what's right for you, who you are as an investor. 
and then stay true to that choice. And remember, even as you make these choices, they have more in common than you think. And this is going to be my parting table where I've looked at the correlation across all the different risk measures I've talked about. And notice that if you look across the risk measures, small companies are riskier than larger companies, tend to have higher betas, tend to have higher standard deviations in stock prices, and tend to have higher standard deviations in earnings. So you might use variance in earnings and I might use betas, but guess what? We're getting pretty much the same rankings for companies. So as you look at this table, that's what I'd keep in mind. With PE ratios and dividend yields, the reason the correlations are so low is remember, with both groupings, it's a stock that pay, don't pay dividends and stocks that are losing money, where you get the biggest heft in terms of forecasting risk, and those are out of this table. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about risk, and in the next few sessions, we'll build on this theme to come up with hurdle rates and excess returns, and we'll be off to the races. Thank you very much for listening.